This chapter presents a parable. In the introduction of, well, the topic, the unproductive vineyard. God is speaking through Isaiah, and he's going to share his heart, and he's going to share a warning with his children in the midst of their disobedience. So let's look at chapter 5 in the book of Isaiah. It starts by saying, Now let me sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved regarding his vineyard. My beloved, my well-beloved, has a vineyard on a very fruitful hill. He dug it up and he cleared it out of stones and planted it with the choicest vine. He built a tower in its midst and also made a wine press in it. He also expected it to bring forth good grapes. Now, that would be great if it stopped there. But it says, but it brought forth wild grapes. What we see here is the heart of God. We see God concerning those that he loves. And guys, I think we so often fail to think of God in terms of one that would express himself like this. What he's saying is, is that I've done all that I can do in order to set you up for success. I provided you with all of the advantages of a properly prepared vineyard. I have given you the choicest land in the best location. I've planted the highest quality vines. Not only that, I've provided you protection and provision. There's even the means by which the fruit that you would produce would be processed and enjoyed right in the same place. How many of you ever look at your life like that? I mean, how many of you ever think about just the blessings that God has provided you in relationship to all of the goodness that surrounds you on a daily basis? Do you think about that? Do you think about the fact that He has prepared the ground, that He has prepared the location? I mean, now sometimes you think, yeah, I, I, I may not be where I want to be. I may not be exactly in the place or in the position or, or have the things that I want, but God would tell us that He has provided provision and protection he's plowed the ground he's cleared the rocks he's created this environment in which we can succeed in all that we do and yet the question that he has is since you're all set up for success what's with all this wild fruit what's with all this bad fruit Now, wild grapes, understand, are really not grapes at all. As a matter of fact, they're more identified as what's called wolfsbane. And wolfsbane is a berry that looks great, smells bad, tastes worse. Matter of fact, it's even poison. And so as we would look at this, what Jesus is, 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 or what God is saying through the prophet Isaiah, he's saying that I've given you everything that you need, and what I'm getting is skunky fruit. I'm getting stuff that doesn't taste good, it doesn't smell good. He says, and now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, Judge, please, between me and my vineyard. The Lord poses a question to Israel. And He asks very simply, Who's to blame for the bad harvest? Who's to blame? Now, this is really a good question because, you know, in natural terms, you can't blame the vineyard for what it produces. You with me? You can't blame the ground. You can't blame the the vine. I mean, the reality is, is it has no or if any, little control over what it produces. It's up to the vine dresser. It's up to the one who cares for the field. It's one for the one who, who cultivates it and keeps the weeds out and prepares the soil and fertilizes it. It's up to the person that is in charge of causing an environment in order for the fruit to be able to produce. The fruit just does what? It just does what it does. It just grows fruit. You realize that if a fruit tree or a plant is, is left to its own devices, that it will grow fruit because it doesn't know how to do anything else. But is that the case in relationship to what we see going on here? The natural sense, and the answer is, well, there's no reason why the fruit shouldn't bear, but in reality, when it comes to people, there is a difference. You see, we have free will. We have a choice. And the reality is is that regardless of the conditions of the vineyard in which we're planted, we have a choice as to what type of fruit that we would bring about. Now, the world says that that's not so. The world says that you can only bear the fruit based on the conditions, the situations, and circumstances in which you're in. 
How many of you have heard that before? Well, the only reason that this person is bad, the only reason that this person struggles, the only reason that this person is downcast or is, is held back is because of all of these circumstances and situations. But yet, have you ever run across somebody that had the absolute worst conditions, worst situation, and absolutely no opportunity and no potential within the circumstance or conditions they were in, yet they rose above? How is it that that, that, that happens? How is it that there's an ability to be able to take and to rise above the circumstance and the condition? And this is what God is saying to Jerusalem and to, to Israel. He's saying, guys, I've given you everything that you need. You're not in a place of a bad circumstance. You're not in a place of a bad, bad condition. You're not under oppression yet. What's up with the fruit? What's up with what it is that you're doing? And this is why it's so critical, guys, that the truth of God's word reaches out into the world because there's those people that are out there that believe that the oppression that they, were, uh, they are under will direct who they are, who they can be, and what they'll inspire themselves to as they grow. And it's not true. You realize that we have entire masses of people that have no expectation of ever having anything more than they already have. And now if it's great, good. You know what? That's a very small percentage. We've got a lot of folks that are hopeless, a lot of people that have no opportunity in their own heart and their mind, and yet God has said, I've given you everything that you need in order to be able to succeed. He goes on in verse 4. He says, What more could, I have, could have been done to my vineyard that I have not done it? Why then, when I expected it to bring forth good grapes, did it bring forth wild grapes? In this parable of the vine dresser, he's right to question the production of the vineyard. God is right to question our production. Guys, God is not to blame for the production of bad fruit. He's provided everything that we need. He's provided the circumstance, the situation, and all of that which would allow us to be able to prosper. If man produces bad fruit, listen, it's man's fault man's fault now the world again doesn't like that the world doesn't want to believe they would rather blame god even those that don't believe in god how many times have you heard somebody that absolutely has no faith in god blame god because of things being all messed up well if god is so good then why does he allow all of these bad things and it's like because god allows bad people to do bad without stopping them or interceding because he loves them so much that he'll give them free will but there's another interesting aspect here of what i see in what's god saying he said i expected it to bring forth good grapes we tend to shy away from thinking that god would actually expect something of us we all have expectations of god don't we I mean, we all have great expectations that God is going to provide us for us. He's going to bless us. He's going to answer our prayers. He's going to, going to minister to us. He's going to heal us. I mean, we go to God with all kinds of requests. God, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. And in return, what does he expect from us? Have you ever really thought about it in terms like that? I mean, what does God expect? Well, and here he says, I expect good fruit. Hmm. In Micah 6, 8, we're told that he has shown us, O oh man, what is good and what the Lord desires or requires of us. He wants us to do justly, to love mercy and to walk humbly before our God. You see, if we see ourselves as being choice vines in the vineyard of the Lord, if we see the position and the, the value that he has placed upon us by preparation and by giving us all that we need, then our natural response, our desire should be to bear good fruit, to do that which honors the Lord. He says, and now please, let me tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge and it shall be burned and break down its wall and it shall be trampled down. And I will lay it waste. It shall not be pruned or dug but there shall come up briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they not rain on it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. And the men of Judah are his pleasant plant. He looked for justice, but behold, oppression for righteousness. But behold, a cry for help. 
You know, one of the greatest fears that we should have in relationship to God is that He would remove His hand of protection. I mean, I talk to a lot of folks, and a lot of people are, are afraid that God will get mad at them, or they're afraid that God's not happy with them, or they're afraid that, that the sinful <coughs> nature that they have and the heart maybe that they present is going to cause God to change His mind about their salvation. And let me tell you what, if you've accepted Jesus Christ and you've believed Him in your heart to be the Savior, risen by God, and, and paid for your sins, you're not going to be in a position of forfeiting your salvation. Yes, I believe that once you are truly saved, you are always saved. Jesus said, nobody can snatch you out of my hand. But you know what we can do? Is we can get to the point that we can run out from under the hand of His protection. How many of you got kids? I don't know how many times I have literally snatched my child off the ground as they were running in the, in the direction of danger. You know how that works? You know, first off, you yell at them, come here, come here, come here, come here, come here, come here, come here. And then they don't come, and so you reach over and you grab them and then you jerk them back. And sometimes, literally from the grip of death. I mean, they're running into the street or they're, they're running into a, into a situation that's going to cause them harm. And the whole idea as a loving father, as a loving mother, as a parent, as a grandfather, whatever the case may be, is that we're going to reach down and we're going to grab that child and we're going to pull them back away from harm. I believe that God will do that to a point. Now, when I was growing up, it was interesting because my father had a different take on things. My dad was a different kind of guy. He was very literal and very practical when he was growing up. I don't know what happened to him when he got old because he changed. He got short. He got old. I don't know what happened to him, okay? But there was a time when I was riding in the back of our 1966 Pontiac Tempest station wagon. Oh, man, the family wagon. That's back in the days before SUVs. That was the SUV. We didn't have seat belts. We had a mattress in the back. And somehow or another, I could be all the way in the back by the, by the window that went up and down at the tailgate, and he could reach me all the way in the back. Sometimes he went out the window and came in the back window, and he would be able to slap me. But what would happen is, is that I would start monkeying. I was in the back seat, and I was monkeying with the door handle. Yeah. And he said, don't do that what this and he just turned left door opened i went right he turned around came back picked me up he didn't have to say anything else i got it i'm a quick learner when you're told not to do something don't do it remove that hand of protection allow there to be something that takes place that proves the point point. and guys we can do that with God and it's exactly what Israel is doing right here and what he's saying is he's saying I'm just going to stop protecting I'm just going to stop hedging the vineyard and within that process what's going to take place is that the vineyard itself is going to be trampled. The vineyard itself is not going to see rain. There's going to be briars. There's going to be thorn. There's going to be all these things that are going to enter in. And it's not because I'm pouring out my wrath. It's because I've simply removed my protection. Often people think that God is bringing hardship and calamity into their life as a, as a matter of some sort of punishment. And really and simply all he's doing is just allowing the natural course of sin to take its place. In order for the vineyard to be burned and trampled, all that needs to happen is that God stop tending it, stop looking after it. As we move on, we move into an area of woe. And any time that we see the word woe appear in Scripture, we need to really pay attention. Now, you need to understand the, the definition of word, the word woe. You ready? On the count of three, everybody just go, woe. Ready? One, two, three. Whoa, that's the definition. But the definition of the word woe isn't, hey, that's wrong, stop doing it. The definition of the word woe means impending doom awaits if you continue. Now everybody say one, two, three, woe. You see, that's woe. And sometimes we, well, woe to this and woe to that. Well, okay, woe. No, no, no. It's not like woe as in hold it. It's like, man, you are toast. If you don't stop, this is very, very serious, even to the point of destruction. In verse 8, it says, Woe to those who join house to house. They add field to field till there is no place 
where they may dwell alone in the midst of the land. In my hearing, the Lord of hosts said, Truly many houses shall be desolate, great and beautiful ones, without inhabitants. For ten acres of vineyard shall yield one bath, and a homer of seed shall yield one ephah. The first woe concerns greed pertaining property and possessions. God was not condemning them for increase. God is not down on us being productive and having possession. Not even to the point of prospering greatly. God's not down on wealth, but what He's down is upon the reliance of wealth and upon greed at any cost. It's been a little while now, and basically we're coming out of it, but it was, oh, just not too many years ago when there was a housing market that was running crazy out here. How many of you were here and remember that? Some of you came during that time. Houses that had been $125,000 were selling for three hundred and fifty. Before it was built, speculation on houses were putting them out at double what you could buy it for as what it would sell for by the time it was completed. People were jumping at every opportunity, mortgaging everything, selling kidneys, doing whatever they had to do in order to be able to buy into this booming economy and buy into this booming real estate market. And a bunch of people did. And I know several people that bought houses that weren't built. And by the time the houses came around and got built, we were in a bust rather than a boom. And they owned houses that they had paid what they thought was half of what it was worth. And they were right. They now owned a house that was half of what they paid for it. And this is exactly what the Lord is saying. He says, if your focus is upon greed, if your focus is upon, and I think it's interesting because there's kind of a, a reference here to overstressed cities, to packing people in, to, to being so compressed and so compacted. And, and I don't know about you, but we'll watch one of these crazy real estate shows, right? And, and a 589-foot, one-bedroom, almost flat type of structure in New York City is selling for $3.8 million dollars. It's like, you got to be kidding me. That's not any bigger than the shed we've got in the backyard. And somebody's going to pay that kind of money because it's in the affluent area. It's in that place. And what God is saying is, i got a problem with that. Woe to those who think that that's a good thing. Woe to those who are willing to prosper at any cost, even if it costs others. In verse 11, it says, Woe to those who rise in the morning, that they may follow intoxicating drink who continue until night, till wine inflames them. The harp and the strings, the tambourine and the flute and the wine are in their feast, but they do not regard the work of the Lord, nor consider the operation of His hands. Therefore, my people have gone into captivity, because they have no knowledge. Their honorable men are famished, and their multitudes have no knowledge. Their, I think I overread that. Their multitudes have dried up with thirst. Therefore, Sheol has enlarged itself and opened its mouth beyond measure. The glory and their multitude and their pomp, and he who is jubilant shall descend into it. People shall be brought down. Each man shall be humbled, and the eyes of the lofty shall be humbled. But the Lord of hosts shall be exalted in judgment, and God who is holy shall be hallowed in righteousness. Then the lambs shall feed in their pasture, and the waste places of the fat ones strangers will eat this next woe concerns those that live for the party or for entertainment now again god is not down on having fun as a matter of fact i think god wants us to have an enormous amount of fun and he wants us to be able to be joyous and to enjoy the ability to be able to to somewhat take advantage of the fruit of our labors and to be able to have nice things. God doesn't have a problem with any of that. He's not calling us to, to not have. He's calling us not to have all of our trust, focus, and interest in the things that are purely for pleasure and purely for, for profit to ourselves. God is talking about those who would take and have no time for Him because their interest lies purely in the things that they think bring them joy. <coughs> I don't know how many times I've talked with folks that are 
caught up in a lifestyle of that fact. And if you look at, at what's going on in, in amongst the, the socialites and amongst the politicians and amongst the Hollywood elite and all of the ones that seem to have all of the best things and all of the best, best of life and they're constantly going to parties and constantly having all of these wonderful things, we find some of the most addictive personalities driven to the point of access in the areas of that which intoxicates. And it can be drugs, it can be alcohol, it can be anything else that would cause them to look after and to seek after and to continue. And the Lord says, that's not good. Now this was the condition of Israel. This was the condition of what was going on in Israel at the time, and the Lord is warning them. And I am so glad that we don't have any of these problems today. Yeah. He says that there's going to be a continual distraction and they're going to fall into captivity. They're going to be captured by that which they actually pursue. Woe to those who draw iniquity with cords of vanity and sin as if it were a cart rope that say, let him make speed and hasten his work that we may see it and let the counsel of the Holy One of Israel draw near and come that we may know it. This is not an invitation for God to come and make himself and to reveal himself in a way that would be positive for the people. This is an out and direct challenge. There were those in Israel that were saying, if God is God and he doesn't like what I'm doing, have him come down here and stop me. Again, I'm so glad it doesn't happen in our culture today. I'm glad that we don't have people that are declaring that there's no God and if there was, that he couldn't do anything about what was going on anyway. And that's the challenge that's being issued here. There's so many that have this mindset. I, I, I've, I've heard about, about literally college professors challenging anyone in their room. We saw How many of you saw the representation in the movie God's Not Dead? It was kind of along those lines. That's reality. If there's a God, prove it. Be careful with that mentality. Because there'll come a time when God is going to make himself known in such a way that there'll not be the opportunity to change your mind at that point. One of the main forces behind this belief that there is no life after death is the hope that there is no judgment. You see, for those that don't want to believe in judgment, for those that won't want to, want to believe that there's a God that is going to set a righteous standard and judge, is the best that they can hope for is to die and not have to face Him. They're in for a rude awakening. Woe to those that call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter, Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. Man's wisdom has always stood in opposition of God's wisdom. Only in and through the Word of God can we see a clear standard of good. The only one that is good is God. It's the only one that's good. Now, are we capable of doing good? Yes, we are. As a matter of fact, we're capable of doing all kinds of good in relationship to man's standard. In relationship to man's standard, all you got to do to do good is give somebody money and you're doing good. I mean, look at all the good that Oprah did when she gave away all those cars and all of that wonderful stuff that she gave away. Oh, she's such a good person. Look at all the blessings that she... Oh, she, what's a, what a wonderful... Really? You see, man's standard of good is self-serving, self-promoting, and ingratiates others. That's man's standard of good. God's standard of good is perfection in relationship and in the eyes of God based on His righteousness and His holiness, to which we can't measure up. We can't. There's nothing that we will ever do that will allow us to be able to measure up to the standard of God. And it's, and it's so interesting because that's the very reason that Jesus Christ came. When we accept Jesus, there's an exchange that takes place. There's a great exchange. Not only do we exchange life for death, but we have the ability to experience His goodness, His light, His sweetness, the wisdom of God, and truly to do that which is good. Woe to mighty men at drinking wine 
or woe to the men mighty at drinking wine. Woe to the men valiant for mixing intoxicating drink. Who justly the wicked or justify the wicked for a bribe and take away justice from the righteous man? This is twice in the same area where there's a woe concerning alcohol. Now, this is a touchy subject for a lot of people. Because there's a lot of folks that really want to think that there's not anything wrong with alcohol. And let me tell you what, as long as it's in the bottle, they're absolutely right. Before that, or that, or whatever it may be, there is nothing in that that hurts anybody. Now, you may be the person in this room that has the capability and the potential to be able to have a drink of wine with dinner or something of that nature. And as a matter of fact, there's an admonition to do that. You know where Paul told Timothy, take a little wine for your stomach. It's good for you. You're stressed out. Have a little bit of wine. He said, have a what? A little bit of wine. What's the standard for using, using alcohol as a Christian? What, what's the standard? <laughs> Two beers? <laughs> Thanks, Mike. <laughs> Is it the legal limit? You know, point zero eight, or whatever. I mean, what, what, what's what's the limit in relationship to a Christian to be listen under the influence of anything? What's the standard? Listen, the moment that it influences you and controls any aspect of who you are, you're out of where God would have you to be. God wants us only to be under the influence of His Holy Spirit. That's the goal. And so when people come, because this is one of those say, well, it's very legalistic to say that Christians can't drink. I don't say you can't drink. I say what the Bible says. You can't be drunk. Can't get drunk. Now, you're talking to somebody that probably was an expert at one point in time in my life on being drunk. I was good at it. I was a member of, of Alcoholics uh, of, of Anonymous, right? No, 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 it wasn't Alcoholics Anonymous. It was Alcoholics <laughs> Apprentice and then Journeyman. <laughs> I was good at it. I was at one point in time to the point that I drank a fifth of Seagram 7 a day and nobody knew I was drunk. Functioning, highly functioning alcoholic. I was good at it. But you know, I was under the influence continually, all the time. And so when people say, well, how much can, can, as a Christian, how much is it okay to drink? Let me tell you how much it is okay to drink. If you can have a drink and it doesn't affect you and it doesn't cause you to be under its influence, then you have that drink anytime you want. The minute that you go one past that, you need to stop continually and always. Because what I've found over the years is most people that can control it to a degree find themselves at some point or time or another, and I'll ask them, I'll say, well, you, so, so you, you drink, but you don't get drunk. Yeah, well, have, have you ever gotten drunk? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Occasionally I'll have a few too many. Well, that's too often. And what's happened is, is during that point in time that you're in that place of being under that influence, you're missing out on a blessing of God. God doesn't want you to be under the influence. So important is, is that he puts it in his word. He says, woe to those that are good at drinking. See, I was one of those. I was in the woe category at one point in time. I was good. I was almost an expert when it comes to being under the influence. In light of Israel's sin, God now warns them of sure and complete judgment in verse 24. Therefore, as fire devours stubble and flame consumes the chaff, so the root will be as rottenness, and their blossom will ascend like dust. Because they have rejected the law of the Lord of hosts and despised the word of the Holy One of Israel, therefore the anger of the Lord is aroused against His people. He has stretched out His hand against them and stricken them, and the hills tremble. Their carcasses were as refuge in the middle of the streets, and for all of His anger is not turned away. But His hand is stretched out still. He will lift up a banner to the nations from afar and will whistle to them from the ends of the earth. Surely they shall come with speed and swiftly. No one will be weary, nor stumble among them. No one will slumber or sleep, nor will the belt of their loins be loose, nor the strap of their sandals be broken, whose arrows are sharp 
and their bows bent. Their horses' hooves seem like flint. Their wheels like a whirlwind. Their roaring will be like a lion. They will roar like young lions. Yes, they will roar and they will lay hold of the prey and they will carry it away safely and no one will deliver. In that day, they will roar against them like the roaring of the sea. And if one looks to the land, behold, darkness and sorrow in the light is darkened by the clouds. The Lord says that judgment is coming and it will be swift and complete. There's no pretext here that God is rescinding or will rescind His judgment through repentance. And the reason is because the people's hearts are turned to evil. And yet, the very reason that He is sending this message, the very reason that Isaiah is repeating is is in the hopes that they will. I don't know if you guys realize this or not, but God is extremely patient. He's very patient. And as long as there's breath, there's hope. But the reality is, is that as we see here, there are those that refuse to be restored. There are those that refuse to change and turn from their sin. God wants nothing more than His people to sin away or turn away from their sin and be restored to a place of provision and protection. As we move into chapter 6, we see an amazing picture of the prophetic call of Isaiah. The timing and the circumstances surrounding his call and the vision that he has are absolutely amazing. As a matter of fact, we see similarities to this same vision of heaven throughout other places of Scripture, other callings, other times when people were, were invited for a glimpse of heaven. They were all given insight to the throne room of God. And it says in verse 1 of chapter 6, In the year that King Uzziah died, King Uzziah was a good king of Israel. One of the longest reigning kings ever. He reigned for 52 years, took the throne at 16 years of age. In Second Chronicles, it declares that he was a good king because most of the time he prospered because he sought the Lord. He ruled, but he had a problem in the end. In the end, well, Second Chronicles says it this way in 26 and 16. But when he was strong, his heart was lifted up, was lifted up to his destruction. For he transgressed against the Lord, his God, by entering the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. Now, God is very much so into following his instructions. You guys realize that, right? Now, we live in a time of grace, so we have this amazing mercy and grace in which we operate to where we have this aspect of forgiveness that Israel did not necessarily enjoy. Israel lived in a time of law. Israel lived in a time to where their relationship with God itself was not only conditional, but it was, it was predicated on if they did right, then they would, they would seek and receive blessings. If they did wrong, they would seek and receive curses. One of the areas that God was very much so a stickler in is he says, I want the king to be the king, and I want the priest to be the priest. I don't want the priest to be the king, and I don't want the king to try to be the priest. Well, see, Uzziah was doing really, really great, and he was doing well, and he was seeking the Lord, and he thought, well, you know what? I have opportunity and need for there to be a blessing. I'm going to go play priest. And so he did. And he stepped into a place that was reserved for, for those that were called to that position by God. And in so doing, he burned incense to the Lord in the temple. Now you would think, well, wow, what's the big deal? He was a man of God. He was the king. He was a good guy. God said, not so much. This isn't a good thing. As a matter of fact, what God did in response is he struck him with leprosy. Struck him with leprosy, and in the end of his reign, he died a miserable and a horrible death because of his unfaithfulness and because he stepped into a place that God said not to go. So we can see for Isaiah being under this time, this reign of Uzziah, this this good king for the most part, how distraught, how it must have taken it and, and really caused him great distress to see not only this king die, but the way in which he died. The fact that he didn't finish well would have been a great discouragement to Isaiah. Yet right at this particular point in time, the Lord calls Isaiah and gives him a glimpse of heaven. 
The significance we're going to see in a moment of God being seated on a heavenly throne cannot be overstated. Guys, you need to understand that God doesn't just occupy heaven. God doesn't just occupy a place. It's not just a location where God hangs out. In heaven is a throne. On the throne sits our God. Now a sitting king, a sitting God, a sitting ruler is a very special connotation. The fact that they are setting means what? means that all is under control. All is at peace. All is going exactly as the king would have it to be. And when we think about this, it's so important to understand that when we see God, as we're going to see him described by Isaiah in just a moment, the way that he saw God, is that we recognize that there is a God that rules the universe. There is a God that rules over the affairs of man. There is a God that rules over this earth. It's not just an image of a God that's out there somewhere, that there is an actual ruler. Now, the world doesn't like to think of God in those terms. They don't want to think of a God that actually rules. They just want to think of a big guy in the sky. They just want to think about this benevolent being or this this object of our attention or maybe our affection. There's this God out there that, well, he's just kind of this, this, you know, I believe in God. He's a good guy. No, no, no. Sovereign ruler of the universe. The one that makes the rules has within him no flaw, no sin, no darkness, is completely righteous and holy. That's the God that we serve. Now, not only do we serve him, but that's the God who loves us. And so it puts a totally different position in relationship to what we see. Look at where he starts in the next portion of this verse. I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings, and with two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one cried to the other, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Again, there's no greater picture than that of a sitting king. Not only do we see that heaven declares, but it says here that the whole earth declares His glory. And the posts of the doors were shaken by the voice of Him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. So I said, Woe is me, for I am undone because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. In the presence of the Lord, Isaiah says, man, I am undone. I am undone. Isaiah says, woe is me. Again, we need to look at the significance of this word woe. The picture here is one of being totally dismantled being totally taken apart. And I, and I had the picture today of, of like a house, all right? And, and think about this structure right now. If every single brick, every single nail, every single screw, every single stud, everything that is in here was in a pile in the parking lot or a car, all the parts, every piece completely disassembled and just heaped up into a pile, that's what it is to be undone. And that's what Isaiah says that he's spirit, experienced. When I saw God... I was undone. I had nothing that was put together within me for seeing the God of the universe. How out of place would we be without Jesus Christ? I mean, think about this for a minute. Isaiah gets a glimpse. Now, I, you know, I, I often thought, you know, it'd be really cool if God would like, like open up and give me a glimpse. And I'm thinking, no, man, I don't know if I could handle it. I mean, everybody that seems to have had a glimpse of the throne room of God comes away from it totally wrecked. Oh, now, useful, yes, but I don't know if I could actually (laughs) do that and still do this. 
if I could experience that in such a way. Because this aspect of coming to the point of realizing that the only means by which we can stand in front of a righteous God, the only means by which we could stand and, under, and, and, and get it at this point in time, Isaiah had an expectation that by faith that he was serving God, but he didn't have a Savior in the form of Jesus Christ. He had the desire and the foreknowledge and the, and, and the hope that there would be Messiah, but there was no Messiah yet. We're in a time of grace. We're in a time of mercy to where we can cry out to God and have this great expectation of standing in front of God covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. And yet, do we ever think about just how precious that blood is that would allow us to stand in the presence of of a righteous God. I love what, what the Apostle Paul said, and we, we talked about this the other day when he declared, I thank God for Jesus. I just thank God for Jesus. How else would we be able to have an expectation of heaven? Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having his hand in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth with it, and he said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is purged. We are truly men and women of unclean lips. Our nature is expressed on what comes out of our mouths, and it comes out in the form of false intent and flattery and double-mindedness and deceit and deception and evil and lies and corruption, and that's just when we're talking nice to somebody. Yet a touch from heaven, and we can be made clean. Not in our power, but in the power of God. And guys, our words matter. Our words do matter because they're a direct reflection of what's in our heart. And we know that in Luke 6 and 45, it says a, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good. And an evil man out of the treasure of his heart brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Now, I don't know what kind of man Isaiah was before this calling, but we can make some assumptions that are fair. He was a man. Probably pretty much so like you and me, because the nature of man really hasn't changed. I'm sure that he had his good days and he had his bad days. I'm sure that there were times when he said things that he wished he didn't say. I'm so glad that I don't have that problem. <laughs> She's not here to correct me. Yeah, timing is everything. I would say that he loved the Lord. There's no doubt that he wanted to know and he wanted to serve the Lord. But being a man just like us, there, there, there has to be within our hearts a change in order for that which comes out of our mouths to change. Isaiah stood undone before the Lord, realizing that he was without excuse. And the Lord touched his heart and touched his lips. Oh, I know it says the angel touched his lips, but he was cleansed, that he was purged of his sin, which meant there was also a change of heart. Because it's out of the heart that the mouth speaks. It's the abundance of the heart. So there had to have been along with that, with this purging, with this cleansing, with this, with this bringing him into the place of his sins being removed, that there was a change within his heart. And this change caused for him to clean up how he spoke. <laughs> And I think it goes beyond just the idea of, of using words that are not necessarily good words. I mean, we live in a society and a culture to where, man, if, if growing up, if I'd have heard that stuff, man, if I'd have used any of that stuff, I remember coming home from the military, man, and I'd spent 16 weeks in boot camp and, and advanced training, and I came home, man, I was lean and mean and, and just, just like an alligator baggy, man. I was just full of myself, and I was all, all ready to go, and I sat down at the table, and I said something that was just so common because it had be, become part of who I hung out with. And that same hand that used to reach around that tempest <laughs> dropped me like a sack of potatoes out of the dining room chair. And I didn't, and I'm like, what? Did you hear what you said? No, but obviously you did. 
And guys, it goes farther than that because I think that there is absolutely no place within the life of a believer to, to do anything that would be dishonoring with our lips. And we need to be cautious of that. We need to be careful of that on the things that we say, even though within our culture today, there's so many words aren't even considered to be provocative or they aren't considered to be swear words anymore. I mean, my goodness, they use them, they use them everywhere. But we're told that we're not supposed to allow any unclean thing to pass our lips. If we wouldn't speak to the Lord in that fashion in a prayer, we probably need to not say it out in public or even within the depths of our hearts. I also heard a voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And this is one of those places in Scripture where people like to mess with the us. And let me tell you what the us represents. The us represents the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's a picture of the Trinity. And I find it interesting, though, that the Lord didn't say, come here, Isaiah, I have a job for you to do. You see, what the Lord said to Isaiah was not that you've been drafted into service, that you don't have a choice. Isaiah, I've called you, and you're going to do this whether you want to or not. What he asked is a very simple question. He posed it in the, in the form of, who will go? Then Isaiah said, he said, then I said, here I am, or here am I, send me. Isaiah doesn't seem to hesitate in his response to the Lord's who will go. Isaiah says, send me. Now this is not kudos for Isaiah. Not pointing to some sort of superior character in, in, in relationship to, to anything other than the effect that it had on him from being in the presence of the Lord. You see, being in the presence of the Lord, standing undone in the presence of the God of the universe, standing and seeing all that God is, being purged of His sin, being made righteous, being touched by an angel in order to be called, put Him in a position of saying, I'm in. I'm in. You need somebody to go? Send me. But notice He didn't say, I'm your guy. He didn't say, hey, pff, got you covered, big guy. I'm the one that you need to let have do this because I've got certain skills and talents. You see, what Isaiah said is he said, send me. Which shows a complete reliance upon Isaiah of God to be one who is sent. And guys, let me tell you what. If God calls you to a mission field, you better hope that the calling comes with ascending. I wouldn't be here in Dayton if I didn't believe and know in my heart that God sent me to be here. Oh, we could have, it was, it was funny. When we first came out here, it was, it was hilarious. I had a pastor from another region, another area, was shocked over the, 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 the growth, the rapid growth of this fellowship and the way that it came together in such a small area and how many people had, 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 had instantly come to this. I mean, we, you know, so many churches struggle for a long time. And, you know, we went from, from 12 folks to like 80 folks in, in a couple of weeks. And then within a very short period of time, in, in less than the first year, we went from the, the school to this building and everything. And she goes, well, no wonder. You picked an area that was growing. I said, oh, so that's how that works. I must have done demographic studies, and I must have looked into seeing how it was. I said, I said man, you don't understand. I, didn't even, I lived in Carson City. I didn't even know where Dayton was. Until the Lord said, go. I need somebody to go to Dayton. Who will go? I said, Lord, I don't want to. <laughs> Honest, I didn't. Did not want to go. Had a good gig in Carson City. Liked it. Doing the worship. Assistant pastor. We had just bought a piece of property. We were building a new building. It was wonderful. And the Lord said, I want you to go to Dayton. I said, <laughs> right. I said, I got a gig. I actually talked to God like that. You know what he told me? All right. Wait for it. November 6th, 2006. Walking on the beach with my bride at 6.30 in the morning. Election day. They were counting dangling chads in Dade County. And I looked at her and she looked at me. I said, do you know where Dayton is? She goes, yeah, kind of. I said, I think that's where we're supposed to go. 
She goes, yeah, I know. So what do you mean you know? Because I've known for weeks. I've just been waiting on you to listen to the Lord. Right. And I said, Lord, if you'll send me, I'll go. But if you won't send me, I ain't going. You've got to send me. And guys, it's the same heart that we need to have in relationship to how it is that we would respond to the call of God. Lord, if you'll send me, I'll go, but I'm not going without you. And that's exactly what Isaiah was saying. Here I am, send me. And he said, go tell the people, this people, keep on hearing but do not understand. Keep on seeing but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy and shut their eyes lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and return to be healed. Now you would hope that with this sending that God would tell Isaiah, you go and preach and the outcome is going to be great. I'm going to give you a mega church, dude. You go out to Dayton and it's going to be fabulous. Oh, I mean Israel. That wasn't the message that he gave him. Instead, the Lord says, I want you to go and I want you to preach to those who won't listen. I want you to preach to those who will see but not understand. I want you to go preach to those whose hearts are so dull, ears are so heavy, eyes are so shut, that they're not going to respond. Why would the Lord send Isaiah to preach to those who wouldn't listen? I mean, why would, why would the guy do that? Why would, why would God do that? Why would he send somebody out knowing? And, and I love Isaiah's approach here in a minute. We're going we're to see how he responds, but we have to first deal with why would God do that? And guys, if God is nothing else, God is fair and he is just. And see, God is about ready to allow righteous judgment to fall upon Israel, and he's not going to allow that to happen. He's not going to allow them to go into bondage and to see the failure and destruction of their sin without warning them and giving them fair warning. He's going to be sure, as they will, that they had an opportunity and they chose not to turn back to the Lord. i got to tell you what, being completely honest, there have been times when I've asked the Lord, are the people not supposed to listen? Are we, really, are we really doing what it is? Am I really doing as this church, as the body, as the, the group of believers here, as a church, are we really doing what we're supposed to be called to do within this community? Are we really, are we really doing those things? And I'll ask the Lord every once in a while, just as Isaiah does. Look at verse 11. I said, <laughs> how long do I have to do this? I, it's what he's saying. He tells Isaiah, go and talk to people that won't listen. And Isaiah says, how long do I have to do that? And look at what he says. He answered, he says, until the cities are laid waste and without inhabitants. The houses are without a man. The land is utterly desolate. And the Lord has removed men from far away. And forsaken places are many and in the midst of the land. But yet a tenth will be in it. And will return and be for consuming as the tabernacle tree. Or as the oak, whose stump remains when it's cut down, so the holy sh seed shall be its stump. The Lord says to Isaiah, I want you to just keep doing it until further notice. Keep doing it until the end. Well, what is the end? Was it the end of Isaiah? Was it the end of time? Was it when Israel was going to go into bondage? I mean, what was the, the significance of the end? Well, we don't know. But guys, here's what I do know. How long are we supposed to continue to teach and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ? To share with our neighbors, to share the love of Jesus in this community. How long? Until we get other orders. <laughs> until further notice. Or until the end. That was the message that God gave to Isaiah. And I believe it's the message that he gives to us. Let's pray.